Well, we've had quite a week in the Oak Mountain community. Um, as uh, Val already mentioned, a number of folks in our church suffered damage, and as most of you are probably aware by now, that includes our senior pastor, Bob Flayhart, and Laurie, who uh, experienced quite a devastating loss. And in light of that, uh, a number of us uh, decided it was better for Bob to stay home this morning, focus on recovering, and so uh, I have the privilege and honor to preach God's Word to you this morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Greg Poole. I'm one of the pastors here, and so I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 21, uh, which is one of the recountings of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. This passage is one where we are shown why our hopes and dreams should be set on Jesus rather than our mistaken ideas of what will deliver us from our fears, our pain, and the overall brokenness of this world. Let me ask you to stand as we read together Matthew 21. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is God's word. Let's again look to him in prayer. Father, we ask now that you would open the eyes of our heart, unplug our ears, and enable us to see and to hear of the beauty of Jesus so that our hearts would be drawn to him. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. A little over 20 years ago, M&M Candy Company ran a special promotion. And in a bag of M&Ms, they were hiding a special M&M. And if you found that M&M, you would get a million dollars. It was a million dollar M&M. One morning, I was sitting at home reading, and suddenly one of my sons, who was probably about four or five at the time, came running in there and said, Dad, Dad, we need to go to the store. We need to buy all the M&Ms. And I said, why? And he said, because there's a million-dollar M&M, and I want to get it. And so I asked him, I said, son, what would you do if you got the million-dollar M&M? And he said, I'd buy a really big toy. Now, I thought about, why did he give that answer? Because in his little four-year-old mind, he thought that a really big toy would make his life fun, exciting, and that's all he needed to complete his life. Now, we, as those who are a little bit older, a little bit further along in life, know that a really big toy doesn't quite do that, does it? And so we can kind of scoff and laugh. And yet, the fact of the matter is that each one of us dream and think about million-dollar M&Ms. We have in mind ideas and dreams and thoughts that if I just had this one thing, life would work. The brokenness, the pain, the disappointment, it'd be taken away if I just had this one thing. So let me ask you this morning, take, take just a minute, a second. It probably doesn't take that long. What's your million-dollar M&M? 
What's the thing that pops in your mind? If I had this. For some of you, it's a bigger house. Some, it might be a smaller house. Some of you, it's a new job. Some, it's no job. Some of you, it's a spouse. Some, it would be a new spouse or no spouse. But we all have them. The things big and small that we dream of that would make life whole. Well, in this event from Jesus' life, as he enters Jerusalem in the final week of his life, he shatters all of our expectations and the expectations of his followers of any hopes of a million-dollar M&M. And he puts himself forward as the one who is our only true hope. So now a couple of things we need to understand as we look at this passage. One is we need to understand what's the mindset of a typical Israelite of that day. We need to remember what's the history of Israel. For 600 years, Israel has been a nation, a country in bondage and subjugation to the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. They're a country who's oppressed. They're a country who's now financially in ruin. And most of the people live in poverty. They live run-down lives. They're beaten down. And yet, if you were to talk to the typical Israelite of that day, they have a great dream. A Messiah is coming, a new king. And when that king comes... Israel is going to be great again. We'll be an independent nation. We'll be free. We'll have money. Life will be wonderful in abundance. But their dream was pretty small. Because it was just a small nation with a little money. And there's so much more. And Jesus is coming to say there is more than simple restoration of your nation to what it used to be. So that's the mindset of the people as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now we also need to think, what's the overall setting? We need to remember Jesus for the last several months has been living in the northern part of Israel, ministering in Galilee. And the current setting is Passover. And every year, everyone living all over Israel would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Passover is the great event of the year when they would remember and commemorate the exodus of the Israelite people from bondage in Egypt centuries before. And so Jesus is joining in with the procession of those people who live in the northern part of the country in Galilee walking to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And as they approach Jerusalem, Jesus does something totally uh, out of the ordinary, totally uh, breathtaking in a sense. It's a showstopper, as it were. Jesus calls a couple of his disciples and he instructs them, go into the village and you're going to find a donkey, bring it to me so I can get on and ride it. And that is absolutely shocking for a couple of reasons. One is just very simply, Jesus always walked. He always walked. Every other story we read of Jesus, he is walking, which has been very typical of a rabbi or a teacher in that day. But then the second reason it's startling is that it's Passover. And the history is you walked into Jerusalem. You walked on the pilgrimage to commemorate and to identify with the Israelite people as they left Egypt on foot. So when Jesus did this, he was making a very purposeful, dramatic act to communicate something to his followers. He wanted them to see something that was going on. What Jesus was doing at that moment, for the first time, is he was publicly proclaiming, saying, I'm the king. I'm the one you've been longing for. Up to that moment, every time anyone would make an assertion, 
that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that's come. Jesus was like, shh, shh, be quiet. Keep it, keep it hushed. And yet suddenly as we enter the final week of Jesus' life, things change. The very last story in, in Matthew 20, the previous chapter, as they're walking along near Jericho, a few miles further up the road uh, before this event, uh, they pass by a couple of blind men. They cry out, Son of David, Son of David. And Jesus, for the first time, doesn't say, Shh, stop. He responds. And he says, What do you want? And they say, Heal our blindness. And Jesus heals their blindness. And now he comes and he does this great public act of climbing on the back of a donkey so that the people would see your king is finally here. And when he does it, what do the people do? They get the picture. Because they've been reminded of a couple of things. As Matthew puts it, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of a burden. A burden. They're, rec- they're recollecting Zechariah 9 where there's this prophecy of a king who would come and would ride in on a donkey. But even more than that, they're reminded of another prophecy. Jesus, as he instructs his disciples, says, Go into the next village and you'll find a colt tied there. Untie it. Hey, come on, words matter. Why do you have to say you'll find a colt tied there? Now, untie it, and actually Mark uses those words five different times. They are trying to draw your attention to something. I mean, Jesus could have just... Bethphage was a very small village. I mean, it was maybe 10 or 15 homes. And Jesus said, immediately when you go in the village, you'll see the cult. He could have just said, hey, guys, walk into the next village, first house on the right, grab that cult and come on. He very specifically used the language of tying and then untying. Did he really need to tell them to untie the colt? I think they got to figure that out. He was recalling Genesis 49, where Jacob makes a prediction. And he, and he says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his, between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tie his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. Jesus is using this language of tying and untying to remind them of the prophecy of Genesis 49. So both of these ideas come crashing down on the people as they see Jesus climbing on his colt, and they erupt, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's the son of David. Our king has finally come. But what's their expectation? Their expectation is simply a political leader who overthrow the Roman government and reestablish their little nation and give them just a little taste of prosperity. But Jesus is about to paint a picture to say, I am so much more than your little million-dollar M&M idea of an independent country. You need far more than what you're dreaming of. And he says the same thing to us. We need far more than what we dream of and hope for in our million-dollar M&Ms. So in this passage, Jesus, as he rides into Jerusalem, as he acts this out, does three things. He answers three questions. He answers the question of, what does he do as our king? He answers the question, how does he do it? And then he answers the question, who does he do it for? Or another way to put it, he gives three descriptions of himself. He says, I'm the king of peace. I'm a king who serves, and I'm a king for the outcast. So the first thing, what does he do? He comes as a king who brings peace. He is a king of peace. As Jesus mounts up on this donkey, he is reenacting the work of Solomon, the son of David who he's just confirmed he is to those blind men. Solomon, when he became king, entered Jerusalem on the back of a mule. Solomon was the king of peace. His very name means peace. We're familiar with the word shalom. 
Shalom, we usually translate peace, but shalom is far richer. It's far more uh, full than simply the word peace. Shalom means, it does mean peace, but it's more than it. It means wholeness, fullness, completeness. It means everything is right. And that's Solomon's name, Shalomun. Jesus is the new son of David. He is the new king of peace. And so just as Solomon entered the city on the back of a mule, not a war horse, Jesus enters the city on the back of a donkey. He's indicating I'm the new Solomon, but I'm a better Solomon. Because all Solomon, the original Solomon could do was reign temporarily over a nation that had extreme prosperity, had peace, but soon it went away. And Jesus is indicating, and he's saying, I am everything the Old Testament has prophesied that's far better than the earthly Solomon could do. I am the new Solomon, the son of David, who can do far more than you ever dreamed. Because, see, what is it we really need? We need two things dealt with. We need God to be brought near in order to experience true shalom, and we need the world to be made whole. And in a sense, Solomon um, hinted at those things through his reign. What did Solomon do? He built a temple. Why did he build the temple in Jerusalem? To bring God near. But yet it was incomplete. Though the temple was built, where, was, where did God reside? In the inner part of the temple. And only once a year did a priest go in to encounter God. So even then, the people were not experiencing the nearness of God. But yet what does Jesus do? He comes as God himself. He walked with his people. He walked among his people. And even today, he walks and lives in his people. Jesus, the new and the better, the greater Shalomon, brings God near into our hearts so we can experience true shalom. Under Solomon's reign, Israel experienced incredible prosperity. Stories are told you, know, you would eat dinner off of a plate of gold. There was an abundance of everything. And what the writers of the Old Testament were trying to communicate is that under Solomon, it was almost like you were back in the garden and life was easy. But yet, even then, death was popping up. There were rebellions popping up. It wasn't complete and it didn't last. We needed something better. And Jesus, through his life and ministry, showed us, I'm the better Shalomon. I'm the one who's restoring the world to what it should be. I'm healing the blind people. I'm raising the lame. I'm even giving life to the dead. I'm the one. Who's restoring the world to a place of perfection and beauty so you can experience shalom. Jesus is our king who brings us perfect shalom that no million dollar M&M could ever give us. So how does he do it? He does it by coming as a servant king. Jesus doesn't enter the city on the back of a war horse. He doesn't enter with pomp and ceremony with an army accompanying him. He comes in on a borrowed horse, or in mean a borrowed donkey, an animal that's not even his. He doesn't even have a saddle. They have to ro fold up their clothes and put on top of it for him to sit upon. He's coming lowly. He's coming humble. He's coming as a servant. What he's doing, he's actually living out what he just communicated in chapter 20. Where in verse 28, he said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is not like any other king. Every other king asks us to serve them. But Jesus 
serves us. And again, we step back and we take a look at Solomon. Solomon didn't serve his people. He demanded they serve him. Uh, Actually, a month ago today, I was en route to Lebanon. And while I was there, we took a journey to the northern part of the country to see the cedars of Lebanon. And if you read in the Old Testament, Solomon got the cedars to build the temple from the cedars of Lebanon. You see uh, pictures in two or three of the Psalms talking about the beauty, the splendor of the cedars of Lebanon. So I'd read those passages about the beauty, the splendor of the cedars of Lebanon. I had these great expectations and I got up there to where the cedars of Lebanon are and there's just not many of them left. There's just a small grove that had been protected since the Romans put them under protection so they can no longer be cut down. And now it's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but these Small grove of cedars have been sitting there growing for thousands and thousands of years. And if you talk to the Lebanese people, they will say that mountain, which matches the story of the Psalms, used to be covered in them. But Solomon had them all cut down. And as I was standing there looking at these bare mountains... And then off in the distance, I could see the Mediterranean Sea. I was blown away to think about how in the world, in Solomon's day, did they get those trees, and these are massive trees, from here to the sea where the Bible says they were then floated down the Mediterranean, and then they were off-boarded, when they arrived in Israel, and now taken back inland and up the mountain to Jerusalem. Well, you read about it in 1 Kings. Solomon forced 10,000 men a month to go to Lebanon to cut and carry those trees to the sea. He demanded his people serve him. But you see, Jesus serves us. And primarily he does it by giving his life for us. He, can, he said in Matthew 20, uh, he predicted, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem and I'm going to be delivered to the chief priest and scribes. And he's now living it out. And one of the ways we see that he's going as a sacrifice is the fact that he gets on a colt and Mark makes it plain. It's a colt that's never had a rider. No one's ever sat on it. And that's important. One of the things you see in the Old Testament is any time an animal is set aside for holy use, it has to have not been used for its primary purpose. For example, you offer a sheep, it's a, it's a newborn sheep. That means its wool has never been shorn. A, a, a bull is offered. It has to be a bull that's never pulled a plow. In uh, 1 Samuel, under Eli, the Ark of the Covenant is brought back in to Shiloh but it's led by or drawn by cows that have never been harnessed. So it's something important going on when it says it has to be a colt or it's a colt that's never been ridden on. What is indicated is suddenly this is a holy moment because it's not the colt who's going to be sacrificed, but it's the rider. Jesus is coming to sacrifice himself just as he said in the previous chapter. He comes to serve us in a way no other person or thing can serve us. So he serves us by giving us his life. And because of that, then he can serve us as we long for freedom. And he says, I gave myself as a ransom for your sin. You're free. He serves us by saying, you want happiness? I promise you joy. He serves us because he knows we long to be cared for. So he says, you're my friend. He serves us as he recognizes our need for security. He says, I'm preparing a home for you. He recognizes our longing to belong. So he makes us his family. He knows we want influence. So he mounts us on a throne alongside himself. He knows we want ownership. 
So he gives us the world. He knows that we want a record of achievement. So he gives us his righteousness. He knows we want a clean conscience. So he takes away our guilt. He knows we want to live. So he dies. He knows we want a perfect world. So he says, I make all things new. Jesus serves us so that we might experience the shalom we all long for. So Jesus is a king who comes to give us shalom. He does it by serving us. And who does he do it for? He does it for the outcast. He does it for those who are on the outside. He does it for those who think they're imposters. Again, you have to understand kind of the social environment. Israel is divided into Jerusalem, where they're going, and then the northern part of the country is Galilee. Jesus has been in Galilee. This crowd he is walking with are Galileans. How do people view the Galileans? It's a lot like America today. You have the urban people and you have rural people. How do those in the urban areas view those who are rural? As less than. And that's the way it was in Jesus' day. In fact, when Jesus was calling his disciples, Nathaniel responded and said, Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that characterized the viewpoint of Galilee. The Galileans were the low-born. They were the outcasts. They were the ones who were disregarded in Jewish society. But yet, isn't that who Jesus had been ministering to all along? He went to the tax collectors. He went to the prostitutes. He went to the lowest. And Jesus comes to you. And he says, if you feel like an outcast, come on. The longer I live, the more I recognize that in our heart of hearts, we all feel like we're outcast. Inside, we all wonder, do I really belong? Just a few weeks ago, I heard a woman sharing a bit of her story. And this is someone who is brilliant beyond belief. She's attractive. She's an incredible leader. She's a high performer. And yet, for almost all of her life, she's wondered... Do I belong? The things that we look at and think are all her pluses make her feel like an outcast. And she's lived this life of insecurity and longing to belong. And see, isn't that all of us? We wonder, where do I belong? And that's the only qualification you need to be accepted by Jesus. It's to say, I long to belong. And Jesus says, if you want to belong, you come on. I'll embrace you. Jesus is for the outcast. Jesus is our king. He does more than any million dollar M&M can ever do. He comes to those who are on the outside and he says, I'll, make, I'll put you on the inside because I became the ultimate outsider. And I was cast off. For you. And in doing so and in serving you that way, I give you my perfect, complete shalom that excels anything you could ever enjoy in any other way. So the call from Jesus this morning is trust me, believe me. I mean, every single day we're invited. Believe and trust in Jesus. So this morning, you might be here and maybe you've never trusted Jesus. Let me just ask you, think about, what are the things you've been trusting in? What are your million dollar M&Ms? How have they come through? How have they failed you? Are they enough? And let me invite you as you walk through this holy week, Walk through with an open heart, an open mind. Examine Jesus. Examine his promises. Examine what he offers. And dare to risk believing that he's the king you need. But my guess is most of us have at some point 
put our faith in Jesus. But every morning we wake up looking around for million-dollar M&Ms. We're a lot like an ex-slave that I read about. And in the 1870s, Jim, who after the war continued living on uh, the land of the man who owned him and continued working for that man, was called into the office of the lawyer in town after his former master died. And the lawyer said, Jim, your, your owner left you $50,000. And just think about that. $50,000 in the 1870s would have been an unimaginable amount of money. He said, Jim, I put it in the First National Bank in town. Just anytime you want anything, you go down to the bank, and the banker, he'll give you whatever you want. You can have anything. Weeks passed, weeks passed. Jim never went to the bank. And the banker went to the lawyer and said, did you tell Jim what he had? And the, bank, the lawyer said, I told him. And he said, well, he's never shown up. He said, I'm going to invite him down and talk to him. So he calls Jim in to the bank, and he says, Jim, do you understand you have $50,000 in this bank? All you have to do is come in and ask, and you can have whatever you want. Do you understand? And Jim says, yes, sir. He said, was well, there anything you need? He said, could I have a quarter so I could go buy a bag of cornmeal? People, that's us. Jesus gives us everything. And we simply settle for million-dollar M&Ms that are worth no more than a quarter to buy a bag of cornmeal. Would you embrace Jesus? See the lies of those M&Ms and recognize he gives you something far greater, far richer, far better than anything you could ever imagine. Let's pray. Oh, Father, that you would enable us to see Jesus for who he truly is, a great king who's come for those who feel like we're on the outside looking in. But God, you are so good, you invite us in. And you come and live in us. And you offer us shalom. Lord God, would you give us grace and faith to rest in Jesus and taste his goodness. We pray in his name. Amen. Please stand as... We hear God's blessing. Now may the grace of your Messiah, your King, the Lord Jesus Christ, be upon you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.